Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alexander Lagan. I am the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist, a research engineer in telecommunications. I filed several patents. I was also elected a delegate for Bernie Sanders in 2016 in the first round, and I was elected an alternate delegate in the final round in 2020. And of course, uh, you know, we thought uh, uh, right around Super Tuesday, we were ahead in the polls in every state in the union. Uh, we felt victory was very much within our grasp. And then, of course, Obama, uh, through whatever influences uh, upon him, uh, called on the candidates to stay out of the race, only Bloomberg and uh, uh, and <clears throat> um elizabeth warren stayed in the race uh and it was a terrible blow it's going to demoralizing to the progressive movement and um the information i've been getting on uh climate change over the last two years uh has been extremely disturbing it appears that we will have a hell world around 2045 uh and how will this occur um, so let's first of all make sure that we have our, our we're in alignment on our facts. So this basically what's happening is the temperature of the earth is rising. Um, and the historical record is that basically since uh, around, uh, let's call it, um, in this chart it's showing us uh, around 10 million BC, but my own uh, analysis well, uh, it's closer to 20 million BC. Um, but at any rate, you can see here where the temperature starts to move in. And then actually around 3 million BC, we see the temperature get to the current average, which is 14 C. Prior to that, the average was 18 C. And that's about 57 degrees is 14 C, 57 Fahrenheit. Remember that includes the poles and the oceans. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, we've been in this uh, uh, for 20 million years. By and large, we have had a, a relatively stable temperature. Um, and we are moving out of it. As you can see, the potential red dots here is plus four by 2050 and plus eight by 2100. Now, the basic problem is that nature cannot adapt in a few decades, which normally takes hundreds of thousands of years. So the climate of uh, California will be in the state of Washington, but the plants and animals in Washington will still be part of a temperate uh, forest uh, pattern, uh, uh, you know, a, a northern climb. And um, uh, so the, ins you know, the animals and insects will perish. Uh, this is the potential uh, problem. And um, in the way this all works, the best article you can read is this one here, Trajectories of the uh, Anthropocene, I think, Trajectories of the Earth System and Anthropocene. This describes, um, first of all, the hothouse Earth pattern, which would wipe out all life on Earth as we know if it happened in a few decades, normally thousands of years, for plants and animals to move around and adapt. Uh, and of course, you know, we've had mass extinctions with asteroids, but even asteroids don't completely acidify all the oceans. So the horrors that we have in, in store for us are substantial, and I will keep this uh, uh, as short as possible, this background, so we have the same set of facts. So this describes, if we destabilize the atmosphere, we end up in this hothouse Earth effect, and we can't get back to a stable Earth temperature if we go too far down. And so basically, uh, you know, the Paris Accords uh, uh, say one and a half degrees C is what we want to limit temperature rise to. Um, but the problem is these feedback loops. So if we move down here a little bit, the feedback loops right here, uh, the Greenland. Uh, so we've already got this year the uh, shelf falling off of Canada, the biggest shelf they had into the Arctic. They lost their main ice shelf. We saw the same in Greenland, a huge ice shelf broke off to the north in Greenland. We see the Arctic literally on fire. Uh, we see severe stresses to Antarctica breaking up. Uh, they lost a, a, a glacial shelf that's twice the size of New York City, uh, uh, broke off in the last three months. And of course, 
the Arctic has produced huge amounts of fires. The Arctic is on fire, as you will hear uh, shortly. So, what happens? We lose the refrigeration of the planet. Then the jet stream slows down. The thermohaline circulation of the ocean slows down. Storms become, uh, weather becomes more persistent because things aren't moving as rapidly so that you have prolonged droughts and prolonged floods. We have uh, historic floods occurring in the Sudan, in Pakistan, in Iran, you know, 100 year, 1000 year uh, floods. And, uh, and um, so we, the weather gets more persistent. Uh, this is what happened with Hurricane Sally. It picked up uh, energy as it came in. Uh, 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 so it did uh, strengthen, but it wasn't a 180 mile per hour, you know, category four or five storm. It was a, like a category two. Um, and it still did tremendous devastation. But what we, what we don't want to see is a category five hurricane uh, coming along and chewing over a major inhabited area at two miles an hour because if that happens to Miami with 150, 180 mile hour winds uh, or uh, other cities along the Gulf of Mexico, it will be real horror, obviously. So uh, as the, uh, as the uh, poles uh, melt, uh, we lose the refrigeration of the planet, we lose the reflectivity, um, and then we have the permafrost melt, which is happening now. So we can just pause for a second. And let's uh, just take a look at what the uh, Google News shows us about um, ice and climate. And uh, so we see global warming shifts Arctic climate from ice and snow to water and rain. Emissions uh, could add 15 inches to 2100. And this is this issue about sort of the three scenarios. Where are we going? Are we going to be at a one and a half C world, a two C world, a three C world, a four C, five, seven, eight? Where is it going? Um, and so uh, the traditional models talked about things like this 15 inch sea level rise far after even our children are likely dead. Um, but in fact, uh, we are looking at 10 to 50 feet of sea level rise by 2050 because all these things have to be added together. And this is where this document comes in. So as the temperature hits, it triggers events, it drives temperature up. Okay, so you've got basically we're Homer Simpson stumbling, falling, one and a half degree, duh, two degree, duh, three degree, duh, four degree, duh. At four degree, when we do the duh again, human life is over. Um, you, it, these, because four degrees C mean it's doubled in one. So that's eight degrees C. And then it can, uh, you can have temperature spikes. So let's say the, uh, in other words, you can have an oscillation so let's go to, uh, now let's talk about 12 C. So we're talking about, uh, you know, now we've already got one C in our records today. So we can take that one C that's already warmed out of that. So we've got three C more than now, doubled when it's inland because this is average including oceans. Um, and then uh, you could give another 50% spike for an extreme weather event. Uh, so you're talking about uh, nine uh, C, which is about, 15 Fahrenheit. So that means that instead of being 120 when there's a heat wave in LA, it'll be 135. And if it's humid, that is high enough to kill someone in 10 minutes. So if you have a power outage, and remember also a lot of houses in LA at the present time don't have air conditioning. It was called a wet bulb event. We've got a lot of these with animals. So there was just a horrific occurrence uh, with um, birds in, in the Southwest. I think it was mass bird death. I think it was New Mexico. Let's see if I get lucky. Mass, yeah, so people, some people who are specialists see this is the most horrendous thing they've ever seen. Uh, now, how many of them died? Well, let's see which of these is most likely to give us accurate information. So it says the number of dirt birds that have died may now be in the millions. 
Um, so, um, uh, you know, this is an, uh, and so, so the, the good news is that uh, uh, when the Biden Sanders task force was established, you had people like Varshini Prakash from Sunrise Movement on the climate uh, task force. Uh, when you had uh, people like AOC involved, uh, and of course, Bernie talking to uh, by the Biden campaign. Um, what has emerged is the strongest uh, centrist Democratic Party platform on climate change it's ever been. And um, so we need to take that pretty seriously, that, that we need the establishment. We, this is not the time uh, unless, well, how to put this, we, on the one hand, uh, Extinction Rebellion recommends, and I recommend, that we create citizen assemblies, basically emergency climate councils in every region, and that this a citizen assembly advises the government and acts in a sense as a parallel government. That way we don't have to deal with the uh, incredible 17 layer cake of voter disenfranchisement in the United States. We can use a parallel structure. So that's all well and good, but we have no time. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. So to get to whether we should support Biden and whether climate is the most essential issue, just briefly, um, there is a desertification. The world is losing, you know, not, to not freak everybody out, we do have solutions. I don't mean that in just a trite fashion. They will take a lot of work, but as articles came out that said that climate change could be effectively halted just by upgrading the soils in the areas we've damaged the world. But this is talking about 20% of the surface area of the world that apparently due to colonial exploitation has been severely degraded. Uh, and you can read about that. But right now we're losing 1% a, a year of our land. Um, the Siberian permafrost could release so much methane that um, it could basically end all of our efforts. Uh, uh, we could release up to 100 gigatons of CO2, which is three years of uh, all of man's production of CO2, all in a, a one fell swoop, and it's leaking now. Um, we talked about the jet stream, the permafrost, then the forest burn, we've got the Arctic forest burning, California forest burning, Oregon, Washington, Amazon, Australia. Um, So uh, this is a map of all the fires going on in the world today. And um, presumably these are the active burn areas because actually there's more going on than this by a long shot. So these are active burns sensed by satellites. Okay, so let's look at Oregon a little bit more. So this is the Oregon's in here, so we can see uh, these are the two remaining areas that are burning. So this is good news, if accurate. Um, La poor Lassen burning, uh, that's a big fire still going on. Um, the Creek Fire, I believe it's called. So, um, and people say, oh, why aren't there, we see fires in Mexico. Well, there they are. And these are the fires in the rest of the United States, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, and when you pull out to get sort of a feeling about these fires, uh, this is rather horrendous, uh, the Amazon. Uh, and then over here in Africa, we have Mozambique, Madagascar, Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia, all not looking very good. And uh, let's see how the Arctic is doing. Oh, we see some fire in this region of the Arctic. So all of this puts more CO2 in the atmosphere uh, and heats the world even more rapidly. So this year we might see 10% of the CO2 that's put in the atmosphere uh, is coming from these fires. Uh, you know, could we, we emit 35 gigatons of CO2 a year and we could see uh, 500 uh, um, megatons uh, uh, from uh, fires uh, above and beyond the normal baseline. So uh, nature no longer is absorbing our pollution. So 
Uh, you can, I'll, I'll post a link to this document. I mean, the insects are, are, are being lost at about 1% a year. Um, corn product, you know, uh, we're going to have food shortages. So the land is shrinking because of uh, soil loss and uh, sea level rise um, and desertification, um, deforestation. So we have a shrinking base with heat, the crops become less productive. Uh, so uh, coffee got wiped out uh, where it was planted originally by the British, the British originally coffee drinkers. I was reading this the other day. Uh, Ceylon was wiped out by this rust fungus. So this rust fungus was not in the new world. So you could not grow coffee in vast swaths of the old world of uh, Eurasia because of this rust fungus. Uh, and 90% um, crop loss. Uh, and this rust fungus is now over here and it's exacerbated by climate change. Uh, more severe, intense, uh, wet periods, hot periods help this fungus. And when, you know, when I was in Bolivia, they can't really plot, plan any more agriculture in a normal fashion because the seasons have gone completely out of whack. So the, we're playing God with the global climate plumbing and uh, it is showing a potential uh, that uh, in my view, if we can move on to what the specific policies are in a moment, uh, could lead to the complete death of virtually all people and animals within 20 to 30 years. Um, so uh, this is existential, it's exponential. So if we invest now, a trillion invested now to stop fossil fuel use, we'll have a payback in terms of what we have to pay 10 years from now, of probably tenfold. So every year we delay, we're probably increasing the price tenfold. It depends on how you value things. But every year we're losing thousands of species of insect, of, of uh, hundreds of species, most likely of mammals, uh, thousands of species of bird, uh, thousands of species of fish every year and they cannot really be brought back. And they took uh, millions of years to develop. So uh, the value, so this is where, you know, I talk about GDP. So in, in right now, in my view, uh, GDP is essentially a measurement of infliction of damage on the earth until we develop EDP, which is how much do we depreciate our natural resource base every year from the damage that we cause to it. So if you put that depreciation, which I call EDP, against GDP, I suggest that the way we live now, we actually are, our net activity is negative. It's damage. It's not production, um, if you follow me. So, so you know, we're facing, uh, we, and we need to probably directly make payments to places that provide us with ecological services like the Congo and the Amazon are two great rainforests because um, business interests are destroying these uh, forests. Uh, and um, so, uh, and it's horrific uh, what this will do to the earth to not only lose the temperate forests, people say, let's plant trees. Well, how do you plant trees if they just burn down? So you have to plant more uh, fire resistant trees. What are the most fire resistant trees? The redwoods which we logged all of, 97% of, and take 100 years to grow. So this is, they create very thick bark so they can withstand very intense fires. Uh, but the younger they are, the more quickly that, that bark burns off. So, and, and as I think I mentioned, Greenland has been condemned. It has been said that Greenland cannot survive. Uh, it is critically ill and will collapse. So this, uh, the state of things is indeed dire. And uh, to show you a picture of one guy's, uh, one scientist's uh, analysis of what a, uh, a 4C world would look like, I'll just show you very briefly. We go here to media, we will find this map. So this map, basically everything yellow 
is virtually unlivable. So we see here Southwest US desertification led to the last inhabitants of this region migrating north. The Colorado River is a mere trickle. The land is used for solar farming and geothermal energy. North Africa, Middle East, solar energy belt stretches for thousands of kilometers, employing a mixture of photovoltaic and solar thermal energy at frequent intervals. A high voltage direct current substation sends power north. Uh, Western Antarctica, unrecognizable now, densely populated with high rise cities. So basically, the green zone is inhabitable in this model, and the yellow zone is uninhabitable. The world four degrees warmer. No one knows exactly what this world will look like, but models provide insights into forced human migrations and our future power generation. The last thing I'll talk about is acidification of the seas. This is just no joke. We're talking about essentially lifeless seas within our lifetimes. Imagine what that will be like to see the photos of all of the floating corpses. And, and, and some of the corpses we'll never see because uh, shells can't uh, form. Within 10 years, the Dungeness crab will be virtually unheard of in San Francisco because they can, they won't be able to form shells. It's already happening. And uh, so the whole natural systems are out of whack. Uh, we will lose our ability to produce food. In my opinion, this map is too optimistic about the inhabitable zone. Uh, you, you could live there perhaps, but um, how would you grow food? Uh, at scale. So, um, you know, uh, uh, so once we're in the 4C world, it's pushing us to the 5C world. Uh, and the question is, where does it all level out? And so we had a long historical period, it was 4C higher than now. And then we have our current uh, interglacial period that goes between our current temperature and down to minus four, that's the ice age, and then back up to where we're at now. And it goes like this, in this, uh, uh, inside this pattern. So, you can listen to others about how dire the situation is. I think I've, I've explained to you that in my view, we have to put aside issues of social inequality um, and a political unfairness to some extent. Of course, we can move on all those issues, elect progressives, develop citizen assemblies, but the key thing is to create a broad alliance to treat this uh, like World War III. I don't like, I don't know if using a, a war analogy is really appropriate since we really want to get out of that mindset entirely. But it's a, we all need to um, you know, saddle up for this ride and we need to get the planetary temperature stable. So in short, at minimum, we have a one in three chance of having a hell world by 2045. There's a one in 10 chance the hell world will be here in the 2030s or even the 2020s. There's a one in three chance that uh, it could be a little bit later than that. And then there's the one in three chance that I don't even think exists where people think that the problems are gonna happen you know, around 2100. Well, we're seeing the like I said, you, you've seen predictions of 10 inches of sea level rise at 2100. I've been, uh, you know, looking at this and saying, this is madness. It's going to be vastly greater than that. Uh, and, uh, and we're seeing it. We're seeing the Arctic melting on fire, Greenland collapsing, and Antarctica breaking up much more rapidly. Then we lose our glaciers, which means all the fresh water to all these communities in India, uh, in South America. Uh, to some extent in the United States, uh, we rely on uh, uh, not so much. I mean, we've already lost most of our glaciers, but uh, it's a serious problem. So I want to uh, let you listen to the speech that convinced me that Joe Biden gets it. I could be wrong. He could be selling me snake oil, but I watched him on Monday give